Hi everybody, I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and this is Last Week in the Church. On today's menu, the popes get their shots, mixed reviews for Francis on women, more Vatican money talk, an award that wasn't, and the legacy of Lasorda. All that and more is waiting for you on the other side, so please, stick around. All right, uh, now look, we do not live under rocks here in Rome. I, of course, know that for many of you watching this in the States, the only news story in the world right now is the ongoing, well, I don't even know what to call it, saga, Greek tragedy, farce, uh, you know, pick your, as we would say here in Italy, prende la tua parola, you know, pick a word. Uh, but in any event, the story of President Donald Trump, the fact that he is now the second president uh, in our history to be impeached, the debate about how much responsibility he bears for those mob scenes at the Capitol on January 6th, and worries about security for Inauguration Day next week, which, by the way, is also my 56th birthday. Uh, so if you're looking for a reason to celebrate and you don't want to celebrate the inauguration, there still is that. Uh, uh, a, a, the thing of it is, this isn't really a Vatican story. There has been relatively little Vatican reaction to it. My own sense is that the Vatican is simply biding its time, waiting for the new administration to take office so it will be clear who is in charge. And I think they anticipate the same mixed relationship with this administration they have had, frankly, with every American presidency since the dawn of time. So, uh, we will continue to monitor this at Crux, uh, but of course this is Rome, not Washington, uh, and believe it or not, there are other things happening here. So, uh, we begin with the fact uh, that this week, two pontiffs, two for the price of one, uh, the reigning Pope, Pope Francis, and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, both got their first doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we don't know this because the Vatican announced it officially. Uh, the Vatican never announces this kind of thing officially. We know it because in the case of Pope Francis, he said it himself uh, in an interview with Italian television. Uh, and in the case of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, his top aide, uh, German Archbishop Georg Gainswein, told a reporter uh, that the Pope had gotten vaccinated. Uh, and in the wake of that, the Vatican, of course, confirmed it. Now, of course, Presumably, those, those are simply the first two doses. As you know, with the Pfizer vaccine, you have to get a follow-up uh, two weeks later. We are presuming, of course, the two pontiffs will get that. Uh, and then, ideally, they will be fully vaccinated. And this, of course, is part of a very strong pro-vaccine push from Pope Francis's Vatican. Just before Christmas, the Vatican green-lighted the morality uh, of using the vaccine. And if you're wondering why they had to do that, it's because uh, there was a kind of mini groundswell in some Catholic circles raising concerns about these vaccines because at different stages in either development or testing, the vaccines utilized stem cell lines remotely derived from fetuses that were aborted in the 1960s. And some were concerned that that meant this was material cooperation and abortion, which of course is prohibited by Catholic teaching. But the Vatican, in concert with the U.S. Bishops Conference and other uh, authoritative Catholic entities around the world, uh, said that no, in this case, the cooperation was so remote and the benefit to be derived so great uh, that the moral thing to do is get the vaccine. And that brings us up to this television interview in which Pope Francis not only announced that he would be getting the vaccine, uh, but he said there was an ethical duty uh, to get the vaccine. Uh, he said that if medical professionals tell you that you should do this uh, and that there are no particular risks involved, then basically you are obliged to get it. Uh, now, all, all this comes against the backdrop of, uh, you know, another surging wave uh, of COVID infections and COVID mortalities all around the world. Uh, we're seeing it in the United States, but we are also seeing it here in Italy. Uh, just recently, the Italian health minister announced that this country's state of emergency, uh, which was due to expire on January 21st, has now been extended to April. Uh, and a whole series of restrictive measures that have already been in place are going to be extended indefinitely. 
Uh, these include things like a ban on traveling between regions here in Italy uh, unless uh, you're doing it for work or medical necessity. Uh, it includes the closure of bars and restaurants in so-called red and orange zones. And it looks like the region of Lazio, where Rome is located, is going to be one of those orange zones. So our bars and restaurants are going to be closed indefinitely. Uh, it includes uh, a, a ban on leaving one's own neighborhood uh, to go to a second residence. Uh, and it also uh, imposes a limit of having only two people at once over to your house. Uh, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Now, you know, what's interesting, that the juxtaposition between these two stories is this. At the beginning, when these vaccines were first announced, there was a very strong what's called no-vax movement here in Italy that is a kind of skepticism uh, about these vaccines. Uh, in part, it was based just on the fact that Italians are genetically skeptical of authority. Uh, in part, it was based on a concern that maybe these vaccines had been rushed, hadn't been adequately tested, might be unsafe. Uh, there's always been a kind of strong anti-vaccine undercurrent of opinion here in Italy for these reasons. And, of course, you add in the Catholic thing. Uh, at one point, polls were showing that almost 40 percent uh, of Italians were saying they weren't going to get the vaccine. Uh, and, of course, had that borne out, you wouldn't have been able to achieve the, the so-called herd immunity effect of having a sufficient uh, portion of the population vaccinated. However... Uh, as time has gone on, those numbers have dropped. Today, the no-vax percentage is around 25% and falling. And although no one can parse this out exactly, uh, this is Italy, where the Pope remains an enormously important cultural point of reference. And some commentators here would give Pope Francis uh, and his Vatican team some of the credit, anyway, uh, for turning things around in terms of public opinion. It remains to be seen if that effect will be true in other places. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's an interesting footnote to the broader COVID saga. All right. Another thing that Pope, Fra Pope Francis did not just get a shot in his arm this week. Uh, he also uh, issued a new decree authorizing women to serve the minister, the ministries uh, of lector uh, and altar server, basically uh, allowing them to uh, allowing girls uh, to be altar servers and allowing women to be readers at mass. Now, you might ask yourself, well, now, wait a minute. In my parish, we've had girl altar servers and we've had women doing the readings for my entire adult life. What's going on? Uh, well, that's true. Uh, in many parts of the world, this has already been common practice, but technically those ministries, which uh, in the old days were part of the sequence of ministries that led up to ordination to the diaconate and then to the priesthood, Technically, they have been open only to men, so the women who have been doing these things have not been formally admitted to those ministries. It's just kind of been common practice. Uh, now, those ministries have been open to women, open to all laity. Um, now, uh, in, in, the res in response to that, uh, there has been a very interesting discussion uh, among Catholic women about whether this does or doesn't represent progress. Uh, the Union of International Superiors General, which is the official umbrella group for the superiors of women's religious orders, put out a statement this week welcoming the move, thanking Pope Francis for it, saying it's another sign uh, of his concern for empowering women. On the other hand, uh, Lucetta Scarafia, uh, the former editor of the women's magazine for L'Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, longtime commentator on Vatican affairs, and an extremely sharp cookie, uh, had a piece this week in which he said, okay, first of all, uh, this is belittling. We never asked for this permission. We've already been doing it. So to say we now have your blessing is actually kind of demeaning. Uh, and further, she argued, uh, that to treat these things as ministries that require the approval of a bishop for a given woman to do actually represents a further stage towards clerical control, cler clerical centralization. Uh, and so she is arguing this is actually a step back, not forward. Uh, that debate continues to play out. Scarafia also noted that the one ministry women actually have asked for, which is admission to the diaconate, uh, Francis has had not one but two study commissions examined, 
Uh, and to date, he has not acted. There's no particular indication that he plans to do so. Uh, and so in her mind, this is kind of smoke and mirrors signifying nothing. Uh, we will see how that plays out. Uh, all right. Uh, we've been talking a lot on this show uh, in the recent past about the Vatican's money problems. That's because they're real. Uh, but a, a couple of things happened this week that may indicate progress. One, uh, Australian Cardinal George Pell uh, gave a talk this week at the uh, Santa Croce University's Program of Church Management. Santa Croce is the Opus Dei-sponsored university here in Rome, and its program in church management is considered one of the better uh, of these kinds of things around. Uh, and Pell talked about uh, recent financial reforms at the Vatican, specifically uh, about Pope Francis's recent decision to transfer control of the money previously controlled by the Secretary of State. You'll remember that was the Vatican Department at the heart of that really embarrassing $400 million financial scandal in London involving the purchase of a former Harrods warehouse in the posh London neighborhood of Chelsea for conversion into luxury apartments. The deal went south. They were left holding the bag. Uh, the fallout from that is ongoing. Anyway, their money has now been transferred to the administration of the patrimony of the Apostolic See, or OPSA, basically the Vatican Central Bank. OPSA now controls basically all uh, of the Vatican's money, so it's been centralized. Pell said that if that move is uh, honestly and faithfully carried out, then it represents massive progress. Uh, and that is an important thumbs up because, of course, Pell, uh, even before uh, the charges of historic sexual abuse in Australia, of which he was ultimately vindicated, uh, even before that, uh, he had kind of been, his wings had been significantly clipped here by, by Pope Francis. Pell, if anybody, has significant reason to be skeptical about claims of reform and progress because his attempts at reform were artificially cut short. Uh, but uh, in this case, he is sort of giving his seal of approval uh, to this move, of course, with the caveat that the devil's in the details. We have to see uh, if, uh, if the good intentions here are carried out in practice. Other development this week that is either amusing or unbelievably frustrating, depending on how you choose to look at it, uh, is that eyebrows had been raised by a recent report from Australia's Financial Intelligen Intelligence Unit, its anti-money laundering watchdog called Austrac, about movements of currency into and out of Australia over the last six years. That report claimed that the Vatican had transferred $1.8 billion uh, into Australia over the last six years. Uh, that by the way, is the equivalent of its annual, its entire annual operating budget every year. Uh, so the obvious question was, uh, A, is this true? Uh, and B, if it is, where in the world did that money come from? Uh, and what was it being used for? Uh, well, uh, this week, Austrac, uh, the Australian unit, uh, after a joint investigation with the Vatican's own financial intelligence unit, announced, oops, uh, the actual amount involved was not $1.8 billion, it was about $7 million. Sorry. Uh, now, uh, at one level, this is just hilarious. How do, you know, I mean, that is not a rounding error. Right? How does a financial intelligence unit that gets paid to track money trails, uh, how do they make a blunder like that? Uh, it still leaves unanswered, of course, what that $7 million were for. That there is, There has been, for the record, some suggestion that maybe it was enemies of Cardinal George Pell in the Vatican paying off uh, people involved in his legal problems in Australia should be said that the victim in the Pell case, the lawyer in the Pell case, uh, the police involved, basically everyone there uh, has denied ever giving, getting a cent uh, from the Vatican. Uh, so whatever that seven million was for, it, it, it does not seem that it had any connection to the legal odyssey of George Pell. Uh, you know, so if you are a Pell fan, his vindication was free and clear. It was not bought and paid for. And if you are a Pell enemy, this is not Vatican money getting him off the hook, okay? The, the two things are apparently unrelated. Uh, all right, an award that wasn't. Uh, if you are an American Catholic, you know the name of Father Frank Pavone, probably. Father Pavone uh, is the head of Priests for Life, one of the most outspoken, some would say pugnacious and confrontational 
pro-life leaders uh, in the United States, uh, who has, by the way, a checkered relationship with ecclesiastical authority, uh, and uh, who was also a major supporter, remains a major supporter of U.S. President Donald Trump, went so far uh, during the 2020 election as to volunteer to hear the confessions of any Catholics who voted for Joe Biden, noting, however, that uh, absolution requires repentance, uh, and so he would not deliver absolution unless those Biden voters repented. Uh, he was slated to get an award from the Regina Apostolorum, uh, its bioethics faculty here in Rome. The Regina Apostolorum is the university sponsored by the Legion of Christ uh, here in the Eternal City. And its bioethics faculty wanted to give Pabone basically a lifetime award for his pro-life advocacy. They announced this. And then just a few days later, kind of unannounced it, uh, basically saying, well, uh, actually, uh, based on things we didn't know about the political and ecclesiastical situation in the United States, we no longer think this is a good idea. <laughs> the thing of it is, uh, okay, the political thing, obviously, is how strongly partisan Father Pavone has been and how much he has identified with Donald Trump. The ecclesiastical thing uh, is that he has repeatedly defied his own bishop in the Diocese of Amarillo in Texas. And corporately, Priest for Life, which is incorporated in New York, has been disowned by Cardinal Timothy Dolan in New York uh, because it refused to submit to an independent audit. And nobody knows where their money comes from or where it goes. Uh, now, the thing of it is, a five-minute Google search would have told you any of that, or really just talking to an American Catholic, uh, you know, maybe somebody who wasn't on the board, for instance, of Priests for Life, uh, before this decision was made and announced, would have provided that information. Just goes to show you that sometimes Rome is from Mars and America from Venus. The, these can sometimes just be completely different worlds, and one can be utterly oblivious to the other. Uh, in any event, Father Pavone now no longer has to worry about how in an era of COVID he was going to get over here to pick up his award because it ain't happening. Finally, uh, last week, uh, we lost a legend. Now, regular readers of Crux will know that I am a baseball fan. Uh, I believe it is the most perfect, the most elegant, the most intellectually satisfying sport ever conceived by human minds. Um, and one of baseball's truly iconic figures passed away, Tommy Lasorda former manager for 20 years, uh, manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers and later an official uh, in the Dodgers organization. Uh, Tommy Lasorda won two World Series uh, in 1981 and 1988. That 88 series, of course, was the famous G uh, Kirk Gibson home run in the bottom of the ninth in game one. You remember that off Dennis Eckersley when Gibson was so hobbled he could barely make it around the base pass but still parked it uh, in right field. Dodgers won that game, went on to win the series. Maybe the greatest single sporting moment uh, of my adult life, uh, that and the miracle on ice. Uh, anyway, uh, Tommy Lasorda was just at the center of it all. Uh, and here's the thing. Tommy Lasorda, first of all, was a very faithful practicing Catholic. Every time the Dodgers had a game on Sunday, whether at home or on the road, he would arrange for a priest to come and say Mass for the Catholics on the team, prayed the rosary every day. Um, but more than that, I, I think Tommy Lasorda was to baseball, in a way, what St. John Paul II was to the Catholic Church. In that, these are both guys who were passionately devoted to their own franchise. Okay, uh, Tommy Lasorda famously said that if you cut open my veins, I bleed Dodger blue. He was Dodger to the core in the same way that John Paul II was Catholic to the core. But precisely because they were so specific, so passionate about their own identities, they became universal figures because people all over the world who were passionate about their own teams saw that same passion in Tommy Lasorda and loved him for it. And people around the world who were passionate about their own religious creeds, however different they might be from the Catholic Church, recognized that passion in John Paul II and loved him for it. In other words, Tommy Lasorda and John Paul II illustrated a great Catholic truth, that the specific and the universal are not an either or. They are a both and. The specific is the key to the universal. If you don't know who you are, 
You can never truly engage someone who is clear about who they are. That is the lesson of both of these icons. And so, Tommy Lasorda and St. John Paul II, res requiescat in pace. Thank you for your life, and please have us in your prayers. That is our show for this week. Thank you for joining us. We will be here next Friday. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will talk to you again soon.